Greetings from St Bride's Church, Fleet Street, here in the very heart of the City of London. We're delighted that you're tuning into this podcast. Behind me, up there, you may be able to see the statue of our patron saint, Bridget of Kildare. As part of our commitment to caring for our planet and changing our lifestyle, both as individuals and as a church, we're reconnecting with the Celtic Christian tradition that she represents and its respect for God's creation. Do please leave a comment or a like and tell us where you're listening from. It's always good to hear from you. And if you would like to donate to help support these online services, you'll find details in the accompanying text. Now, may the light and peace of Christ be with you all as our worship begins. A very warm welcome to St Bride's to our service of choral evensong on this, the third Sunday before Advent. Wherever you are in the world, and however you're listening to us, we hope that you will feel that you are very much part of the St Bride's family. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel now 
and humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter <coughs> live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Old Testament lesson is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 10, beginning at the 33rd verse. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord.
The New Testament lesson is written in the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, beginning at the 23rd verse. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that, when it is come to pass, ye might believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in thy beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, 
may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A few years ago, I attended a training course for spiritual directors, during the course of which we got into a fascinating discussion about the difference between the Garden of Eden and the Kingdom of God. Let me explain what I mean by that. We always think about the Garden of Eden, as described in the book of Genesis, as being the embodiment of life in all its fullness and perfection, a life of complete and idyllic peace and harmony between human beings, God, and the natural world in a past that is now lost to us as a result of the fall, the Adam and Eve story. Alongside that tradition, Scripture also looks forward to an idyllic vision of the forthcoming kingdom of God, exemplified in our reading from Isaiah this evening, 
which some of you may recognize as a popular reading at Christmas time, where we are told, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and so on. There are some apparent similarities between the two, but are they actually the same thing, the Garden of Eden and the Kingdom of God? Interestingly, the conclusions that the group came to were that the two things are not the same at all. And if anything, there are certain respects in which the vision of the kingdom of God is preferable. The reason is this. If you think about it, the Garden of Eden is a representation of a life of simple, uncomplicated purity, which comes to us as total gift. Whereas the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, represents a resolution that is achieved in part at least through struggle, which is what gives it wisdom and depth. Let me explain what I mean by that. The prophet Isaiah, in a passage picked up by Jesus in the Gospels, describes the kingdom of heaven as a place where, amongst other things, wounds are healed and sight is restored to the blind. Any of you who have ever struggled with serious illness or disability will know that you are never more appreciative of the importance of health and well-being than when you are deprived of those things and seldom more grateful than when they are restored. Or to give a different kind of example, there are few human experiences more powerful and more poignant than the restoration and healing of a broken relationship. Very like suddenly rediscovering something extremely precious to you that you really thought was lost forever. The Orkney poet Edwin Muir wrote a remarkable poem in which he observed with remarkable insight that although we might assume that the fruit of the Garden of Eden remains unsurpassed, in fact, the fruits that are really worth having are those that come from another place altogether, from a place of struggle. He wrote this. But famished field and blackened tree bear fruits in Eden never known. Blossoms of grief and charity bloom in this darkened fields alone. What had Eden ever to say of hope and faith and pity and love? Strange blessings never in paradise fall from these beclouded skies. In other words, when life is difficult, as it invariably is from time to time, we must always resist the temptation to respond by trying to withdraw from the world and its pain into our own personal, mythical kind of Eden in which we can insulate ourselves from the demands and challenges of the outside world. Because that, in reality, is no kind of peace at all. It is simply a delusional and rather self-centered form of denial. But let's go back to that vision of Isaiah for a moment. Many years ago, before I trained for the ordained ministry, I studied classics, and I did a research degree into the equivalent in classical literature of visions of paradise, motifs such as the Golden Age theme and the Isles of the Blessed. Some of these visions and images are very much rooted in present reality, others much more remotely. But interestingly, one recurrent motif makes a direct link between a just earthly ruler and the welfare of nature, to the extent that if you have a righteous king, the crops 
grow better. You can find this idea as far back as Homer's Odyssey, where, in one passage, Odysseus describes the kind of king who is blameless and God-fearing, who, and I quote, upholds the way of good government, and the black earth yields him barley and wheat. His trees are heavy with fruit. His sheep flocks continue to bear young. The sea gives him fish because of his good leadership, and his people prosper under him. I can remember when I first came across that very idealized passage, thinking it quaint and rather touchingly naive. These days, oddly enough, I'm not so sure, because although such a notion might at first sight seem extraordinarily fanciful, its opposite is demonstrably the case. If you look around the world today, it is frequently the most corrupt and oppressive regimes that are also the greatest polluters of our precious planet. And they are also the places where the poor and the vulnerable and the marginalized suffer most. There is a very direct and very real link between justice, righteousness, and the integrity of creation, which is something we would do well to note in the wake of the COP26 meeting. Indeed, that should perhaps be the benchmark against which we evaluate the credibility of all political authorities, including our own. However, it is also the case that the vision of the kingdom of heaven can never be achieved by human struggle alone. It is very much the power of God working in us and through us that helps to bring it a little closer which is where our second reading this evening from St. John's Gospel comes in. As we heard, as Jesus prepares to take his leave of his disciples, Jesus promises them peace, a true and lasting peace, a peace that transcends anything that the world can offer. It is the kind of peace that means we no longer need be afraid. And it is the Holy Spirit that enables us not only to glimpse that reality, but to help bring it to birth. And to sum up all of this, the kingdom of heaven is, as this evening's collect reminds us, the product of God's just and gentle rule. But we all have our own role to play within that too. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in thy beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you called brothers to leave their boats at the lakeside and follow you. Give your church courage to step out in new ways to proclaim your good news. We ask for your blessing on the leaders of your holy churches and especially on Justin and Stephen, our archbishops, Sarah, our bishop, and Alison, our rector. We pray for all who serve this community of St. Bride. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, your call confronts us with the need for repentance. Turn the hearts of all to the values of your kingdom. Forgive our conflicts and destructive ways. We pray for peace throughout the world, in every land, in every community and every human heart. And we ask for your blessing on the leaders of the nations. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you shared our human life, its joys and sorrows. Bless all who are struggling with the strains of care. May the sound of your call refresh us. We remember before you all those in our parish community in this city and around the world who are in need at this time. We ask for your blessing upon them. We pray also for any others known to us and all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, your nets encompass all humanity. Gather to yourself all who have died. We remember before you the recently departed and those whose year's mind comes at this time. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Bring us to rejoice in your saving love. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We commend ourselves and all for whom we have prayed to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers. prayers. For the, for the sake, sake of, of thy, thy Son, Son our, our Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen.
The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. <laughs>